Super. Euh, donc, euh, pour ceux qui, celles et ceux qui s'en rappellent, j'ai déjà présenté euh, des, des résultats préliminaires de ces travaux euh, il y a peut-être deux ans maintenant. Et euh, donc, euh, ici, je vais vous présenter donc, les résultats finaux. Et euh, je pense que je vais faire la présentation en anglais, euh, comme ça, euh, vu que c'est enregistré euh, sur YouTube, on pourra, on pourra partager euh, plus largement. So, um, hello everyone. As uh, Agnès said, I'm uh, currently a postdoc at the Museum für Naturkunde uh, in Berlin, Germany. But uh, this project has been made when I was in my previous postdoc at the University of Oxford. And uh, previously, prior to that, I was at the MNHN in Paris uh, during my PhD. So this project is about paleogenomics and in particular how to infer uh, the origin of the Teleos whole genome duplication from fossilized cell structures. So as I said, this project is about teleosts. Teleosts are a clade of vertebrates, a major clade of vertebrates, more than 30,000 species, very diverse, very uh, present in every aquatic environment, very familiar for some, very weird for others. Um, but when you compare teleosts to their close relatives within actinopterygians, very thin fishes, um, teleosts are extremely more diverse than their other, uh, than the other actinopterygians, like uh, polypterids, um, gars, and sturgeons, for example. When you take the, the whole vertebrate diversity, it's even more blatant. You can see that teleos represent more than half of other of over um, sorry of every vertebrate species, and other actinopterygians are very depopulate today. So, what was the driver of the diversity of teleosts? What is the root cause of their modern diversity? So. Historically, it's been proposed that they have maybe key morphological innovations that explain their morphological success, their, eco their evolutionary success. Um, for example, teleosts have um, symmetrical caudal fins uh, that are actually internally asymmetrical but externally symmetrical. And when compared to a non teleost like a sturgeon here on the top, they have. Uh, You can see in the sturgeon, the, the dorsal um, part of the dorsal or the caudal fin, sorry, is longer than the ventral part. Then, uh, and in teleos, it's uh, symmetrical. So potentially, it's, it played a role in their um, swimming performance. Um, also, teleos have these mobile jaws, is in particular the premaxilla and maxilla that are that can be projected forwards to um, create some kind of section to to help with feeding. So that's a potential other key innovation. Um, but also what has been proposed is that uh, genomic characters uh, that are um, specific to teleosts are um, at the origin of this um, diversity. And more specifically, there is a teleost uh, specific whole genome duplication uh, that uh, is inferred to have occurred at the origin of the modern teleost clade because uh, every modern teleost that we know so far have a duplicated genome and not their non teleosister sister groups. Why would a genome duplication create a generate biological diversity? Well, it's possible then uh, through duplication, you create uh, new functions of genes, uh, you create, uh, um, you, 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 yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry, new functions of genes, or uh, you modify the function of genes, the expression of genes, and this is due to um, the, the, the presence of two copies in the genome, so that uh, decreases the selective pressure on each of the copies. Um, it has also been proposed for other clades, uh, for example, within vertebrates, we know that There have been two genome duplications at the origin of vertebrates before the radiation of jawed vertebrates, so that might be also the explanation of their uh, modern diversity, uh, also in other animal clades and also in uh, angiosperms, for example, that uh, underwent multiple um, events of whole genome duplication. So to specify what we're talking about, here you can see a simplified tree of um, vertebrates. And <clears throat> here in the bottom is the teleos crown group, and the three clades uh, on the top are the non teleos actinopterygians. And ancestrally, you have a single copy genome. 
So that's what you have in non telostactinopterygians like gars, bowfins, um, polypterids, and sturgeons. And with teleos, modern teleos, we know they all have a duplicated genome. But what we don't know is when this duplication occurred. Because there is a time interval of about 100 million years between the um, diversification of the crown group, so the modern clade, and the divergence between teleosts and their modern sister group, which is holosteans, represented by gars and bowfin. Uh, we know that based on the fossil record, and also it's confirmed by uh, molecular clock analysis. And the good news is that within this time interval, there is a diversity of fossil taxa, entirely extinct lineages that are called collectively stem teleosts. And obviously, we don't know the genome of these animals because they are entirely fossil. So we don't know exactly when during this whole time and phylogenetic interval did the duplication occur. It could have happened th theoretically at any of these nodes. The good news is that we have some way to know genome size in fossils. Um, first and foremost, we know that genome size correlates very well with cell size. It's been observed initially with um, blood cells, so erythro erythrocytes, sorry. Uh, for instance, when you look at this very old uh, figure that has been uh, reproduced by Gregory in 2001, you can see that the, 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 the red blood cells of um, um, urodils, amphibians, like the salamanders, and uh, lungfishes are much larger than in other vertebrates. And that's because actually lungfishes and urodils have the largest genomes known today in vertebrates. In comparison, the cells of um, mammals and birds and actinopterygians are much smaller. You can see another example here. Um, the, the lungfish cells and the urodil cells are much larger than in other amphibians and in birds, for example. And that is um, proportional to the genome size. Interestingly, it also occurs in other lineages, so it might be something that is universal to uh, living organisms. For example, you can see here in stomatal wart cells, so it's in the cuticle of plants, uh, angiosperms in particular, you can see that genome size also correlates with the size of these particular cells. For vertebrates, there is a cell type that is quite useful for paleontology, it's osteocytes. And they do also correlate with genome size. You can see that on the top on a study of birds and in the bottom for tetrapods as a whole. And you can see here that um, salamanders are particularly larger than the rest of tetrapods. So that correlates with their, once again, big genome size. So what are osteocytes? They are one of the three main types of bone cells by far the most abundant. Actually, they are one of the most abundant bone cells in the whole body. Um, they derive from osteoblast, osteoblasts, sorry, that are cells that are on the surface of the bone, and they probably become trapped uh, when bone grows and become osteocytes in this process. So they are trapped within the bone matrix, which is mineral, but they are still living cells. They communicate with each other, with the surface, and they are thought to play a fundamental role in bone physiology, in particular in bone modeling, remodeling, and homeostasis. And interestingly and crucially, osteocytes are preserved very well in the fossil record. We can see that in, a, in a, one of the oldest known actinopterygians, Chirolipis from the Devonian, so very old indeed. <clears throat> and this relationship of genome size and cell size in osteocytes has been used actually for a long time by paleontologists. For example, here there is a study from the 70s that um, used the fossil record to try to infer the evolution of genome size in lungfishes. And you can see that the, the increase in genome size in lungfishes has been somewhat um, uh, gradual during the geological time, and that the oldest known lungfishes from the Paleozoic had smaller genome size, much smaller genome sizes than in uh, uh, modern uh, recent lungfishes. Here is another more recent example with dinosaurs. So you can see then uh, that uh, non-avian dinosaurs, so for example, the theropods, have small genomes 
exactly like modern birds, so potentially the small genomes of modern birds were already present in non-avian uh, dinosaurs. So that's great. That means we can infer the genome size of these extinct lineages of teleosts and know in which node and at what time did the genome duplication occur, because we think that probably if there is a genome duplication, then genome size is going to double. The first question I had was, can we do this kind of study on teleosts in particular, because it's never been attempted before? And first, can we use osteocytes? Because there is a problem, which is in that many teleosts, actually most modern teleosts, bone is acellular, or more precisely, an osteocytic, which means that they don't have osteocytes in their bone matrix. You can see an example here in the tilapia, but also other teleosts have osteocytes, so it's not universal in teleosts. <clears throat> and so I did um, a study to, to, to find out exactly when in teleost evolution uh, uh, osteocytes were lost uh, by scoring the, the presence or absence of osteocytes in, uh, in a lot of uh, actinopterygian taxa um, and optimizing the, the ancestral states. And, um, the result is that cellular bone, so bone with osteocytes, is ancestral for teleosts and actinopterygians, so it's present in the earliest diverging teleosts and also in the stem group teleosts, the, these extinct taxa we're interested in. So osteocytes are available for paleogenomics. That's a great news. Uh, the second question is, does it work on teleosts? So for that, we have to look at osteocytes in modern uh, actinopterygians and see if there is a correlation between their size and the genome size. Um, but there are several limitations that um, we, uh, we encountered when doing this, uh, when designing this study, and uh, in particular designs, uh, design issues that were already present in other um, studies. Uh, for example, um, the previous ones were mostly focused on tetrapods, like the dinosaur uh, study I showed previously, and they used thin sections, which may be um, misleading for estimating uh, osteocyte volumes because osteocytes in general have an irregular shape, they, have a, uh, a, they are elongate and flattened at the same time, so depending on where you cut them, you will have a different, a very different estimation of their surface and thus of their volume. For tetrapods, this problem is somewhat resolved because they use long bones that are um, that that happen to have osteocytes that are all somewhat oriented in the same direction. But in teleost, it's probably much harder to find uh, an equivalent to long bones with uh, osteocyte orientation between predictable in the same way. Thankfully, we can uh, have other ways to. Um, observe osteocytes, uh, and notably in three dimension with uh, synchrotron um, microtomographic data. So I collaborated with Sophie Sanchez from the University of Uppsala in Sweden, and she developed a method to image osteocytes using synchrotron radiation. So you can have very good results, very good contrast between the osteocyte lacuni and the bone, and you can reconstruct them in 3D. All these little blue things are the osteocytes, and it's in a modern amphibian, in a modern salamander. And it also works with fossil bone. Um, on the left, I think you have uh, some early relative of tetrapods, and on the right, you have a placoderm, so a very old jawed vertebrate. And in both cases, you can see the osteocytes in blue. And the good thing is that using uh, some specific software, you can actually visualize the volume of these osteocytes. Um, here on the left and on the right, you can see that there is a, some, some degree of color variation, and this color variation reflects the size of the osteocytes. The blue ones are the smaller ones, and the orange red ones are the larger ones. So that means it's great. We can, we can do that and uh, have data that is easier to compare and uh, with a better quality and also uh, in a, a larger amount of data in general with more osteocytes per sample than with thin sections. So we took material, uh, we went to the ESRF synchrotron here on the top, it's in Gr Gr Grenoble in France, it's the European synchrotron. Um, 
and it's been uh, used many times to do this kind of studies. And then later we also went to the diamond synchrotron that is close to Oxford in England. And as far as the sample we used for the study, we took representatives from the Taylor's Crown group, modern and fossils, representatives from um, non telios taxa, um, also extant and fossils, and of course, many representatives from the Telios stem group, in particular uh, from the Mesozoic. So just to give you an example of what kind of animals were the stem group teleasts, you have actually quite a diversity in these animals. You have uh, ambush predators like the Aspidorhynchiforms. Uh, for example, this one is, uh, has been fossilized while feeding on a pterosaur, so a flying reptile from the Jurassic. Um, in the bottom, you can see pachycormiforms that some of them were actually huge, the size of modern uh, uh, whale sharks or uh, baleen whales. And they were actually filter feeders like, like these modern animals. Um, you can see here on the right, you have giant predators like uh, Xifactinus from the late Cretaceous and a whole diversity of kind of non-descript, uh, generic looking stem teleosts that you would in general lump into this kind of paraphyletic, polyphyletic uh, ensemble of cold folidophorates. And you can find them in particular in the early uh, Mesozoic. So that's great. We have all this sample covering the fossil, the, the extent uh, from uh, the Paleozoic to the extent, covering the whole tree of actinopterygians. Uh, in total, that represented, I think, more than 70 um, samples, 70 species. And we brought all that to the synchrotron and to, to make sure that we had comparable results across uh, teleos and actinopterygian diversity, we always took the same bone, which is the dentary, the lower jaw. Um, why the dentary? It's because it's often fossilized, uh, so easy to find in fossils. You can find an example here. Um, and its, it's uh, homology is uh, never in doubt, and it's present in every taxa that I can think of. So it's a good, it's a good bone for that. Um, for the extant taxa, we use dry collections, so entire dentaries that were uh, prepared previously, either in, in, in research collections or in um, uh, patrimonial collections. And uh, for fossils, we usually took a very small sample of uh, fossil bone from an area that was already broken, like here, to ensure that the anatomy of the fossil was not disrupted too much. And for one species, the carp, we took 10 different bones uh, in order to test whether there is a variation of cell size uh, within the skeleton and not just from one species to another. So this is the kind of results we had. So this is uh, from the dentary of a, of a polypterid. So you can see here these things with um, that are dark and with canaliculi that go all around them in a star-like shape are the osteocytes. Uh, so you ca the canaliculi are these um, connective canals through which the, the cells connect with each other. And uh, these little dots are actually canals that go through the bone and that are completely non-related to osteocytes. So when you model all these osteocyte lacunae in 3D, you can, you can have this kind of results on the bottom and you can see already the, the, the color variation with smaller osteocytes be, be, being bluish and bigger osteocytes be, being greenish. So you have thousands of osteocytes for each uh, specimen. So that's a great amount of data. And based on this big amount of data, you can have um, a distribution of the, of the size of osteocytes because there is a variation. And in general, you would have a normal distribution. So what we looked at actually was not um, the whole variation, but the, the mode of this um, normal distribution. And also that allowed us to look at other parameters of osteocyte diversity within uh, teleost. So for example, we were able to uh, encounter intrabone variation, uh, in particular during growth. You have these kind of growth lines that uh, follow the seasons. So every year uh, in spring and in summer, the animal will grow faster, and so these, uh, its osteocytes will be bigger. 
And then in the winter, growth will become uh, slower and osteocytes also will become smaller. So you can actually see that from our data. And in order to um, diminish the bias uh, due to this intrabone variation, we took kind of a, a vertical uh, sample throughout the, the growth uh, of each bone to in order to prevent um, uh, uh, having a, a bias in our measurements. Uh, also, as I said, in, in, in the carp, I tested several bones from all over the skeleton. And you can see here that there is actually a variation between the from one bone to another. So osteocytes are noticeably larger, for example, in ribs than in the dentary. So that confirms that it was a good choice using always the same bone uh, from one species to another. Otherwise, that could bias the results as well. As for the interspecific variation, what we were looking at was the genome size. So I went to this um, very useful database uh, curated by uh, Ryan Gregory, the Animal Genome Size Database. And it's actually particularly rich in actinopter regions, and you have um, genome sizes for a lot of taxa. And uh, so we were able to um, establish the relationship between uh, osteocyte lacuna volume and genome size for uh, 34 species of extant actinopter regions. So this is, this is the result here, and you can see several interesting things. First, there is uh, a correlation. Uh, genome sizes are bigger when cell sizes are bigger. Um, <clears throat> and also what is uh, maybe surprising is that in teleosts that are duplicated, that have a duplicated genome, um, cell sizes are not particularly uh, bigger than in non-teleosts. So non-teleosts here are in, are in black, um, and teleosts are in gray and in white. And most teleosts are actually, uh, actually don't have genomes that are much larger than non-teleosts. Um, but that is actually explained by the distribution of genome sizes in modern actinopter regions. So we know that um, non-teleosts actually have quite a spread in genome size, and teleosts tend to have smaller genomes, even though they underwent a genome duplication. And uh, the reason why is that probably after the genome duplication, there was a reduction in genome size, uh, kind of an optimization of genome size, sort of. Um, and that we know because um, we can infer the loss of various copies of genes all across um, the, the, the telos tree. So probably they lost gene copies, they lost um, repeated elements, non-coding elements that made their genome size smaller, even though uh, they underwent a duplication. But that could be a problem for our study, right? Because that means we can't see potentially the duplication. But thankfully, when you look at some teleosts that had a secondary duplication later on. Uh, so after the, 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 the duplication event that is common to all teleos, there were other uh, smaller, smaller scaled uh, genome duplications, especially in salmonids, so salmons and trouts. And you can see here representatives of, this, of these animals, and they, they all have very large genomes because their genome duplication is mo much more recent than the teleos one. And probably they didn't have much time to reduce their genome size. And their cells are also much larger than those of, of other teleosts. So polyploid taxa, taxa that underwent a recent genome duplication, are particularly well uh, discriminated by this uh, approach. And that's great because that means that we can detect the fossils that recently underwent the genome duplication in the fossil record. So here are the results of the study. To do the study, I used um, a, a time tree that, that is based on molecular data, so the most recent, most uh, comprehensive um, molecular analysis of actinopter regions, Roboski et al. And uh, it's, uh, so it's already time calibrated, and I stitched it for soul to the tree based on a set of phylogenetic studies. Sadly, there is not one phylogenetic study that includes every uh, fossil stem and crown teleos and the modern one. So uh, there is not one tree that we could use. So I had to rely on doing a, a kind of a compilation of various studies. And the ages of the fossil taxa are put on the tree based on their uh, fossil age and also uh, same as for the nodes. So the, the, the nodes are either based on 
the, the time tree, the molecular time tree, or on the inferred uh, minimum age of the clade based on the fossil record. And from this uh, base tree, I, uh, I, I, I took the measurements of uh, the osteocyte lacunae. So for the extant ones, it, it was already done as, as I showed you before. And then we did the measurements for the fossil taxa. So more than 60 species. Um, as I said earlier, stem, crown teleost, other actinopterygians from the early Triassic to the Pliocene, so the, the very recent. So you have a very big diversity of taxa and of ages. And all these, uh, all these uh, uh, cell sizes were uh, mapped on the tree, on the base tree, uh, using, uh, uh, using some, some software, in particular APE, uh, that is implemented in R. And the uh, ancestral states were estimated also with the software, and that allows you to have an estimate for the genome size at the nodes of the tree, and not just at the terminals. So what do we observe here? Several things. First, as I said before, you can see very well the modern polyploid crown teleosts. So the ones that underwent a recent duplication, uh, like Salmonids here uh, with the red star, uh, they have much larger cells. And so you can see them very easily from the tree. And when you look at fossil teleosts, you observe very clearly then the other, the older, sorry, um, uh, representatives tend to have much larger osteocyte lacunae. So here you have early and middle Jurassic taxa, a late Jurassic one, it's a bit smaller, and then in Cretaceous and, and uh, post-Cretaceous um, specimens, the, the cells are smaller. And it is not particularly phylogenetically uh, uh, bi biased, it's uh, either stem or crown teleosts that tend to have bigger cells when they are older. And you can see that more clearly with this figure here. So when you look at the oldest fossils in our sample, teleos fossils in our sample, they, they, their cell sizes are in the range of the modern polyploids here, here in red. And the more recent ones tend to become smaller and reach the same range of size as the modern uh, crown teleosts that don't have a duplicated genome. So there is a decrease over time of genome size that you can track on the tree here from this point to this point uh, within the crown group and actually also within several lineages. For example, here you have this fossil lineage that is called ichiodectiforms they seem to have had larger genomes at their origin and then they decrease in size over time. So the decrease in size that we observe and that we infer from genomic data is observed here from fossil data. And you can also tell that it happened somewhat independently in various lineages and not uh, within the, the, the stem of uh, the modern teleosts. And of course, from this information, we can infer that the genome duplication happened early in the teleost um, uh, evolution. So here you have the uh, separation between teleost and their sister group, holosteans, and genome size almost doubles here. It, it goes from um, 150 to almost 250. So we consider that genome duplication probably occurs in this node at, well, at least at this node, so probably earlier. That means that the minimum estimated age for the genome duplication is the middle Triassic based on the divergence times of fossils. What's interesting is that when you look at uh, these earliest teleosts that we know, uh, think were uh, already, already had a duplicated genome, um, they did not have the the key synapomorphies of modern teleos, the one that I presented at the beginning as potential key innovations that drove teleos diversity. For example, the symmetrical caudal fin uh, appeared several times and later than this inferred duplication. Same for the mobility of the premaxilla, it seems to be a more recent innovation. And when you look at the disparity, the, the, the diversity of the shapes in teleosts, um, so the, let's say the phenotypic diversity, or at least the, the, from the phenotype we have access to, so the skeleton in the fossil record, 
you can you can see that actually uh, the diversification of the phenotype of Telios occur much later in the Mesozoic, uh, in particular in the late Jurassic and in the Cretaceous, while the duplication was in the Triassic. So the duplication did not immediately trigger a diversification of shape in Telios, and actually for a long time, for hundreds of million years, they stayed uh, less diverse than non Telios, uh, in particular Holosteans that are here in blue. So in conclusion, um, we use the paleogenomic approach to map genome site through the fossil record of the Telios crown and stem groups. We infer an increase in genome size comparable to that of modern polyploids at the node of the Telios total group, so all Telios including the, the stem group. We infer that uh, in this node at least there was already a whole genome duplication and that means that the whole genome duplication occurred at the very least in the middle to late Triassic. And then there was a decrease in genome size in all Telios lineages, including some fossil ones. And the, I guess the main biological conclusion of that is that the whole genome duplication did not co-occur with the appearance of key morphological characters or a diversification of morphologies. And so we can at least partially reject the hypothesis that genome duplication was a trigger for Telios diversity because there is no direct correlation that is observed between it and morphological diversification. Thank you for your attention, and um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer to them, uh, either in English or in French. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donald. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions en français, en anglais? Je peux poser ma question, parce que je dois partir Martin. après. Uh, merci beaucoup, hein. mais je crois que je me souviens, moi, d'avoir écouté un séminaire, je ne sais pas si c'était vous, par contre, je ne me souviens plus si c'était vous, sur euh, l'utilisation des eaux, euh, des eaux COC pour, euh, pour, euh, pour, euh, pour trouver la taille, euh, la taille du génome. J'avais été très impressionnée d'ailleurs, parce que c'était la première fois que j'écoutais ça. Bah, c'était peut-être moi, vu que j'ai déjà ben, présenté voilà, je pense, première alors, version. Je, ouais, euh... je pense que c'est ça, je pense que c'est vous. Enfin, je, je, malheureusement, je ne me souviens plus de votre visage. <rire> euh, alors, la chose que je voulais vous demander, c'est euh, l'effet sur la, la taille de l'animal. Alors, peut-être j'ai manqué quelque chose que vous avez dit, mais est-ce que, par exemple, dans le cas des salmonidés, où là, il y a eu beaucoup de, 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 de duplications, est-ce que les animaux euh, modernes, ils sont plus gros que les, les animaux euh, en plus anciens quoi euh, Alors, on a testé, je ne l'ai pas précisé, euh, mais on a testé euh, différents paramètres par rapport à la, du, à, la, à la taille des cellules, on a regardé la taille du génome et on a regardé aussi la taille corporelle. Et il n'y a pas particulièrement de corrélation entre la taille des cellules et la taille corporelle. Et ça rejoint d'ailleurs des observations oui. qui ont été faites sur d'autres groupes de vertébrés, par exemple chez les oiseaux. Euh, donc euh, non, quand il y a augmentation de la taille du génome, il n'y a pas augmentation de la taille des cellules. Il euh, n'y a pas augmentation, pardon, de la taille corporelle. Ce n'est pas, pas comme pour les plantes, quoi ou, ou... Où le, euh, les polyploïdes sont souvent euh, plus, 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 plus gros, quoi. Bah, ouais. du, du coup, non. <rire> oui, c'est ça. Hein. Non, mais c'est vachement intéressant. Ouais. Parce que justement, c'était une des questions que je me posais, savoir si le fait qu'il y a une réduction du génome euh, au cours de, 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 de l'évolution enfin, de, 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 de ce groupe, je me demandais s'il si, euh, y avait aussi une, une taille qui avait réduit. Euh, voilà, donc en fait... Il n'y a pas de corrélation du tout entre la taille de l'animal. Pas particulièrement, non. Oui, c'est ça. Bon, d'accord. Merci beaucoup. Hein. Euh, c'est quand même vachement différent des plantes. Hein. Ouais. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Je vois qu'il y a Alors... quelqu'un qui lève la main. Euh... Non, je ne vois personne. Euh, y a que, oui, y a moi, je euh, c'est Mireille, j'aurais une question. Vas-y, Mireille. Euh, D'abord, je voulais euh, vous les féliciter, je trouve ça excellent. Je suis passionnée par ce que vous faites. Bon. <rire> moi, je travaille sur les coraux, ça n'a rien à voir, mais je trouve ça euh, hyper intéressant. 
Euh, justement, je me posais, en fait, c'est au niveau de la méthodologie. Bon, les résultats, je ne suis pas spécialiste de poisson, je trouve ça intéressant, mais après, je réfléchis un peu à une façon avec laquelle je pourrais essayer d'appliquer votre méthode chez les coraux. Mmh. Du coup, je me suis dit, en fait, le volume, ce que vous mesurez, c'est un volume de vide. C'est une... C'est une vacuité, quoi. C'est un trou. Oui. C'est le trou correspondant à la taille de la cellule. Ouais, tout à fait, ouais. C'est-à-dire que, euh, alors, c'est vrai que je ne l'ai peut-être pas bien précisé, mais ce qu'on mesure, ce n'est pas les ostéocytes en elles-mêmes, ce sont les, les lacunes ostéocytaires, donc les cavités laissées par les ostéocytes euh, après leur mort euh, dans l'os. Mais on sait aussi, par ailleurs, que euh, la taille des, la, des lacunes ostéocytaires est proportionnelle à la taille des cellules quand elles sont vivantes. D'accord. Et euh, en fait, vous avez estimé le volume en, en millimètres, c'était quoi hein euh, En micromètres cubes. En micromètres cubes. Donc, vous avez une idée de, de la taille, en fait, du diamètre moyen de ces, oui, oui. De ces cellules Oui, bah, de toute façon, c'est bien connu aussi à partir de données euh, histologiques, euh, en histologie classique, en, en la main, c'est tout ça. C'est des cellules qui vont faire... Euh, quelques dizaines de microns euh, de, de longueur et quelques microns d'épaisseur en général. Ça, ça dépend évidemment de la, de la taille de la cellule, ça dépend euh, du taxon, etc. Mais il y a une variabilité, mais c'est dans cette ordre de grandeur-là. D'accord. Bon, ben merci pour ces informations et encore et... Euh, bravo, ça passionnant. Ah, pardon, et... je vous ai coupé. Non, non, mais enfin, du, du coup, si, si, si vous dites que, si vous pensez que chez les, les, les coraux, par exemple, parce que c'est vrai qu'ils sont minéralisés aussi, il y a des types cellulaires qui se retrouvent, euh, qui sont visibles euh, à partir de, de, du, du, de la matrice minérale, ce serait intéressant de voir si en effet on peut retrouver ces types cellulaires euh, dans le registre fossile et, et de voir s'il y a une corrélation avec euh, la taille du génome. Oui, ouais, ouais, effectivement. Bon, bah, c'est sur des coraux anciens, hein, du, du carbonifère, mais je vois que <rire> vous êtes allé jusque. Enfin, oh, bah, ce n'est pas une question d'âge, ouais. a priori. Hein, donc, ouais. Euh, ouais. Ça marche aussi sur des, des fossiles euh, très bah, anciens. Oui, oui. Ok, bah, peut-être je vous recontacterai, je vous partagerai <rire> mes idées. En tout cas, merci beaucoup. Il y a quelqu'un qui lève la main encore Oui, euh, Henri, euh, si il y a une question. Oui <rire> C'est peut-être une mauvaise manip. Oui, je ne sais pas. Euh... Ok, oui, pardon. C'est mieux comme ça oui. Et voilà, vous me voyez même. Euh, donc, merci pour votre euh, très belle présentation qui est passionnante. Euh, donc, euh, si j'ai bien compris, euh, la duplication de génome n'est pas corrélée avec une innovation majeure euh, morphologique ou, ou écologique euh, chez mmh. les téléostiens. Je connais mal euh, l'évolution euh, précoce. Euh, de poissons, est-ce qu'il y a eu des radiations, euh, donc disons de, des événements d'innovation de, chez, euh, chez euh, vertébrés aquatiques euh, avant euh, euh, En fait, la question revient est-ce que cette duplication des génomes était un, euh, un élément qui a permis ces innovations qui semblent être euh, manifestées euh, effectuées plus tard ou est-ce que il est complètement déconnecté euh, de possibilité d'innover de, euh, mmh. écologiquement ou morphologiquement. Bah C'est un peu difficile de répondre à cette question euh, à, juste sur la base de ces données, parce que ce qu'on voit, c'est qu'il y a une décorrélation. Euh, après, il euh, y a cette diminution de taille du génome qui s'accompagne de changements euh, de changement génomiques, euh, 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 disparition de certaines copies de gènes qui ne sont pas forcément les mêmes d'une ligne à l'autre, etc. Donc peut-être que pourrait y avoir un lien avec plutôt cette réoptimisation de la taille du génome euh, plutôt qu'avec la duplication en elle-même. Euh, donc ce serait une, con une conséquence indirecte. Euh, après, c'est impossible de le démontrer sur la base des, des données qu'on a. Peut-être qu'en regardant euh, plus spécifiquement... Euh, euh, 
le génome des, des, des actuels, on pourrait voir euh, s'il y a des, des en, en termes d'expression de gènes ou de choses comme ça, s'il y a des, des, des choses qui émergent par rapport aux différentes lignées qui sont plus ou moins diverses chez les télostéens, parce qu'il y a une grande disparité de diversité, comme, comme chez tous les taxons, au sein des télostéens, il y a des groupes extrêmement mmh. divers euh, ouais. et d'autres qui sont euh, assez, assez pauvres en espèces. Euh, et ça, ça je, je, ça n'a pas l'air d'être particulièrement corrélé à, à la présence ou non d'une duplication, parce que par exemple, chez les salmonidés euh, qui ont euh, cette polyploïdie euh, plus récente, ce n'est pas un groupe particulièrement diversifié au sein des téléostères, hein, c'est même un groupe plutôt peu diversifié et assez homogène en termes de, de, de forme. Oui. Oui. Oui, oui. Donc, euh, pas de lien direct. Merci beaucoup. D'autres questions Sinon, moi, j'en ai une. Ouais. Donald, euh, est-ce que tu aurais d'autres exemples que tu pourrais voir pour la duplication des salmonidés C'est vachement impressionnant quand même, euh, la, la différence de taille. Euh, mm -hmm. J'ai des génomes récemment dupliqués. Est-ce que tu aurais ouais. d'autres euh, taxons chez lesquels tu pourrais tester ce genre de choses Ou est-ce que tu envisages de faire... Est-ce que ça pourrait être propre aux salmonidés pour une autre raison Oui, c'est vrai. Euh, alors, il y a... Hum, euh... Il y a d'autres, euh, je crois, je crois qu'il y a aussi chez les catostomidés qu'il y a une duplication, euh, comme chez les salmonidés. Et, et dans, dans mes données, ils avaient aussi, on avait une espèce de catostomidés, ils avaient un génome plus, plus enfin des, pardon, des cellules plus grandes aussi que, que les autres, que leurs proches parents. Euh, après, le problème, c'est que cette méthode, elle marche avec des types cellulaires qui sont euh, propres aux vertébrés, euh, les ostéocytes. Et euh, chez les vertébrés, les seules duplications euh, du génome complet qu'on a, ce sont euh, chez les téléostéens. Euh, ou alors, tout à l'origine des vertébrés, mais là, on n'a on a pas de, de, de représentants actuels qui permettent d'en témoigner. Donc, on a, on a, ces, on a cette, cette duplication euh, chez les téléostéens, et après, au sein des téléostéens, il y en a quelques autres, mais chez les tétrapodes, par exemple, euh, à ce que je sache, il n'y a pas de duplication du génome qui, a été, euh, qui est connue. Euh, il y a aussi chez les esturgeons, euh, qui a eu, euh, des, il me semble, plein de mini-duplications, mais c'est un peu plus compliqué chez les esturgeons parce que leur squelette est réduit et euh, assez cartilagineux, donc euh, c'est plus dur de, de suivre ce genre d'informations. Euh, après, un taxon candidat potentiellement pour étudier ça, ce serait les, les plantes euh, vasculaires. Euh, il y a eu beaucoup de duplications au cours de leur évolution et ils ont, enfin, il y a aussi des cellules qui se préservent dans le registre fossile chez, chez ces organismes. Euh, mais euh, à ma connaissance, il n'y a pas encore eu énormément d'études qui ont été faites euh, chez, les, chez les angiospermes et, et, et les gymnospermes. Merci beaucoup. D'autres questions ou... N'hésitez pas. Par contre, oui, euh, si, pour quand même répondre partiellement à ta question, si, quand tu dis euh, les salmonidés, ça pourrait être lié à autre chose c'est possible, mais on sait par ailleurs que, comme je l'ai dit au début, la, la, la taille du génome corrèle très bien avec la taille des lacunes ostéocytaires. Par exemple, les dipneustes et les, et les euh, urodèles vont avoir des, des ostéocytes beaucoup plus volumineux que chez les autres vertébrés, et leur génome est aussi beaucoup plus volumineux que celui des autres vertébrés. D'accord. Bouziane, tu as une question Oui, salut Donald. Salut Bouziane. Bonjour Agnès. Ouais, tu disais qu'il y avait une duplication chez les vertébrés. Ouais, il y en a deux même. Et bon, j'imagine que ça va être très difficile de voir chez des fossiles de stem vertébrés euh, la taille des. On y a, on y a pensé. <rire> Avec Damien Germain, on a co-encadré un stage de M2 l'année dernière euh, qui visait un peu à tester ça. Euh, le... Mais il y a plusieurs problèmes, comme tu dis. Euh, déjà, les, les premiers vertébrés euh, n'ont pas. Enfin, les premiers vertébrés qui ont du, du squelette, parce que déjà, possible, cette duplication a pu avoir lieu avant l'apparition du squelette, donc là, on n'aurait pas de, de traces euh, dans, dans le squelette, vu qu'il n'y en avait pas. Et euh, même les premiers vertébrés qui, faisaient, qui, qui avaient de, de, de l'os n'avaient euh, pas d'ostéocytes. Euh, les ostéocytes apparaissent chez les, euh, euh, enfin, dans le clade euh, gnatostome plus ostéostracé, donc... Euh, seulement une sous-partie de l'ensemble des vertébrés euh, fossiles. Et euh, du coup, ça, ça crée euh, le problème que potentiellement la duplication a eu lieu avant ça et on ne peut pas en avoir la trace euh, avec les méthodes actuelles. Alors, ce qui serait intéressant, ce serait de regarder euh, si d'autres types cellulaires qui sont préservés chez ces taxons euh, 
on reflète aussi la taille du génome, par exemple les odontocytes euh, qui sont présents chez certains premiers vertébrés qui ont de l'os acellulaire. Euh, mais voilà, pour l'instant, l'échantillonnage n'est pas, pas encore euh, vraiment disponible. Euh, et puis, il euh, y a aussi le problème de, euh, comment on dirait ça en français, le, le phylogenetic bracket, c'est-à-dire que là, avec les télostéens, on peut, on peut avoir des taxons euh, proches qui, qui, qui servent d'extra-groupe. Avec les vertébrés, on ne peut pas. Donc, euh, ça pourrait aussi créer un biais. D'accord. Okay, Mais ce serait bien de pouvoir le faire, je suis d'accord avec toi. <rire> Ça marche, merci. Encore des questions Bon, bah, s'il n'y a plus de questions, je vous remercie tous beaucoup, et surtout Donald, pour sa présentation. C'est toujours euh, un plaisir euh, à écouter. Et bah, puis, merci. Euh, à bientôt. À bientôt. Au revoir.